Hello and welcome to the Swarscope Podcast. My name is Ryan Walker and with me, as always, is the witty Ruben Williams. How are you today, mate? G'day, Ryan. I'm very well. Thank you. Um, witty, thank you. I, I don't have a witty response to fire back at you. I wish I, wish I did, but uh, mm. yeah. Thank you for that introduction. You're looking fantastic tonight, as always. I'm glad that we're uh, on YouTube think- now. People can actually start to appreciate how handsome you are for a change. Oh, well, Rubes, I mean... Don't make me blush. Um, but no, thank you. It's good to get a haircut. Um, I say. I think we've mentioned it the last couple of podcasts, but um, been, been talking about it for a while. Yeah, the last lockdown's got me, and I'm. It's still pretty short, which is great. So mm. um, no, I'm going well. I'm going well. Very excited um, to share this podcast with everyone. Morgan mm. Mitchell, um, mm. absolutely awesome. Um, mm. So we'll get onto that in just a moment. Um, before we start, um, I've got a question for you. At yeah. uni, mm. how did you used to do you, your um, like your timetables? Because personally, I used to always make sure that I had as basically Tuesday, Wednesday packed because I yep. love to go out on a Sunday and a mm. Thursday and probably every other day. Yep. I'm not sure how <laughs> you did it, but yeah, preferably in the afternoon as well. Yeah, yeah. I... Uh... I used to make sure that my timetable didn't start before 12 p.m. because I'm yep. not a morning person, Ryan. I've uh, mm. I've missed an exam because I slept through it. So I made sure never to do that again. And then the other issue <laughs> I had with my timetable is once I would receive my timetable, I'd then go and draw up my own version of that on an Excel spreadsheet. So I would have to put in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then add in the dates. Now, if you get the dates to the days wrong, that can yeah. mess up a lot of things. Yeah, so I can see how in that my, could happen. In my former degree, I'd already slept through one marketing exam. When I got to Deakin, I missed two exams because the exam timetable I created for myself had the wrong date attached to the wrong day. And by the mm. time I realized two exams had already gone by. (laughs) (laughs) So they made three Uh, exams that I missed (laughs) during my time at university. So gee, it's, it's concerning. Uh, It's really concerning, (laughs) but but it's good to see that you've, yeah, I mean, you're here now. You've obviously rectified that issue. Um, Mm. But no, that all, that all happened at the beloved Deacon and we do Mm. love Deacon. Um, And I'm happy that they obviously taught you how to maybe fix your time management um, and maybe do some timetabling better. So (laughs) <laughs> um, it's good because at Deakin, every single course is backed by industry experts, as we know. Mm. Um, so everyone who goes there is basically confident that you'll get the job you want uh, with a degree that employers want. And the timetable um, you want. And the timetable you want. So it's uh, it's progressive real-world learning if you think about it. So um, Deakin Uni, we love them. Um, before we start, if you want to learn more about us and who we are, uh, find us on LinkedIn. Um, you know my name. That's Reuben Williams, uh, and he's, just, he's Ryan Walker. That yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, flick us a line. Uh, we're happy to chat, um, and we'd love to chat about anything and anything. Uh, our career, short career, uh, our experience on the podcast, whatever's coming next, anything you hear on the podcast, we'd love to chat. So um, let's get cracking on Morgan Mitchell. Um, what are some things that you loved as part of this interview, Rubes? Yeah, so uh, she was phenomenal. She was super relaxed, super easy to talk to. But we've finally got the time to chat with an elite athlete and find out what their perspective is on the people who who help them. So a lot of our audience are people trying to work with athletes. Now we can actually kind of flip the flip the tables a bit and find out what are the things to do, what are the things not to do. And one of the really great things Morgan talked about were a couple of critical things to avoid. She mentioned a few former uh, managers that she's gone through and other, you know, members of, of Team Morgan that she's gotten rid of as well. So there's a couple of really critical things in there that, you know, if you have any aspiration to work with an elite athlete in the future, you've got to avoid these things that Morgan talks about. Yeah, I did I did love that point she made. It was it was a juicy part of the uh of the episode. Um I love the bit where she just kind of spoke about the 
the process of working with athletes. So it's not just what you see on TV where it's just like they run a race and that's basically the, the centre of their life. That's really not the case. And she just, you know, she spoke a lot about that, you know, off the track and how that influences so much of her on-track performance. Um, and, yeah, it was just cool to hear that a lot of it comes down to, you know, what she enjoys and what she wants to do and that's so pivotal to, to how she how she runs and how she performs. Mm, particularly some of those involvements with the, the brand campaigns too I thought were, were fascinating. Yeah. Um, but also a lot of people who want to work in sport, they struggle to really articulate why they want to work in sport. And we posed to, to Morgan, why do you have the future career aspirations that you do? And she spoke beautifully about what she wants to do in the future and why it's meaningful to her. And I said to her off air, like if she takes that answer and puts it in front of anybody and says, this is what I want to do and why, nobody's going to say no to that. So Mm. um, I think there's a lot people can take away from articulating their why from from what Morgan um, finds important to her. Yep. All right, we'll grab a pen. Enjoy the chat with Morgan Mitchell. Morgan, welcome to the Sports Grad Podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Can't wait. All the way from Darwin. <laughs> yeah. How's it yeah. going up there? <laughs> Honestly, this is a safe space, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually enjoying it because we can go outside. So I've just been tanning every single day. Um, I'm actually loving it. <laughs> is this like a, does it feel like a second uh, athlete village? Uh, kind of, to be honest, because we're with all the other sports as well. Um, so like once you walk, when you walk into your laundry, it's kind of cool because you get to see like the rugby girls, the swimmers and all of that. Um, but it also does suck because they patrol it every few hours and they're like, get your mask on, stay in mm. your lane, like, you know, get back on your balcony. It's just, I don't know. I, yeah. I'm sure everyone has a, an opinion on this pandemic, but I just think it's a bit much now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Is there any like uh, teams or athletes that you've uh, enjoyed getting to know in this experience? Um, to be honest, yeah. Like there's Ben Buckingham. He's a 3K stapler, two doors, three doors down. He's actually pretty funny. Like I wake up every morning, I'm a pretty early riser, and he'll just poke his head out. He'll say something to me, just go back inside. <laughs> and I think he's in the middle of like both the, um, both of the like, what do you call it? Um, units or whatever like he's in the middle of everyone so we all kind of get to hear what he has to say Mm. um and then there's my coach across the road and maddie clark next door as well who's got some good chats so and these are guys i had never really i don't think i'd met either of them before Mm. until the olympics Mm. so i think (laughs) looking in (laughs) it kind of seems like everyone knows each other like the whole olympic team like you've all you know done your respective sports together but is that actually the case? It'd probably be more like just a group of complete randoms coming together to represent the nation. Yeah, it, it kind of is. <laughs> but, like, you got to think, <laughs> I think because, you know, you've got all of the um, Institute of Sports around Australia, yeah. that's how we kind of meet each other. And some Ooh, of yeah. us have made teams before. But then it's also, like, I think it is just natural for Aussies to, you know, you see someone in, like, the bright green and gold and you're going to say, hey. So yeah. Yeah, everyone is quite friendly, which is good. Yeah, it's like when you go to Europe and like everyone sounds Australian. It's like, oh, okay. It's like we haven't really moved countries. We're just we're in the same place. It's just yeah. everywhere. So <laughs> same stuff, really. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Morgan, did you do a, did you do any trading at the Olympics with you with your kit? Yeah, I got um. Well, I got. It's funny, you know how everyone's into pins. I didn't realize it was mm-hmm. like still a big thing. I thought we did that, you know. <laughs> back in the team big days um, but I gave all my pins away because I just didn't care and now that I've seen a few of the other ones I'm like shit why didn't I keep them um, and then one of my friends who I competed against um, oh, back when I was running the four I swapped some kit with her and she's from the USA so I was pretty happy with that nice. I'm not gonna yeah. lie That's, that was pretty clutch <laughs> Did you, uh, Ruben's a big kit person loves oh, me really? well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, I got onto the kit because um, I did an internship with Australian University Sport and got to go to the World Uni Games in Taipei in 2017. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was phenomenal. And But I, what I didn't realize was halfway through the event, everyone starts like walking down the street with their merchandise and starts trying to trade with you. 
<laughs> but you've got to be careful because you don't want to get stuck with someone who's got terrible merch given away like, you know, a nice item for it. So you kind of oh, got to do a bit of... washed merch? Ugh. Yes, yep. So you got to do like a bit of scouting, find out which countries have got the good manufacturers, which ones have got the nice designs. Yeah. And then like pick out a target and be like, hey, don't give that shirt to anyone else. <laughs> Add them on Facebook. I'll meet you at this place in this time and then do the trade. And so... I <laughs> still, sounds uh, something like something else. It's weird. Well... <laughs> That's, that's, that's how you upgrade cookery for uh, Adidas and, and Nike. Hundred <laughs> percent. I think like the top two for me this Olympics were obviously USA because they always nail it, mm. and France actually had a really nice uniform as well because I think they have mm. Lacoste. So like, oh, yeah, yeah, like... yeah, they were dressed so well. Um, <laughs> I'm not bagging our kit or anything. I'm just saying. No, really I, good. I thought our kit was quite cool. I love the Asics. Right, yeah. like, they were everywhere. Um, yeah, no, I think they nailed it this year. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we're always look good. Like green and gold, it it just yeah. goes. Like some other colors, you just look at you like uh, not unlucky with the colors there, guys. Yeah, orange, <laughs> we look pretty good. Yeah, like yeah, orange, weird. <laughs> mm. um, Morgan, I'm glad you mentioned your uh, your rule around dinner. Uh, no dinner past seven p.m. Because yeah. um, when you look at people who compete at the highest level, usually they've got like a few pretty tight parameters around them, around their life in the terms of the things they do and the things that they don't do. And uh, one example that I'll never forget came from a podcast I listened to with Hugh Jackman. And he mentioned that he will never go out after a performance. But on the contrary, every single morning he will meditate and read with his wife, which I thought was absolutely lovely. Not <laughs> morning. That's I know, sweet. exactly. Thank so you. I was wondering, other than no dinner after 7 p.m., are there any non-negotiables with your training? And if so, what are they? To be honest, the dinner past 7 is just because I'm stuck in quarantine, so I don't want to be overeating. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, non-negotiables. To be honest, I'm pretty relaxed when it comes to stuff like that because our sport, we're always traveling for it and we're always in a different city, country, state, whatever. So for me, it's just kind of like common sense to do the right thing, you know, like don't drink during the season, get regular um, physio and massage, like all of that's kind of normal for me. Um, but I just think, yeah, because the environment is always changing, I try not to stick to one thing just because I've seen athletes freak out when they do have those non-negotiables mm. but they can't get it in the back streets of Hungary. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like from then on I just thought, nah, I'm just kind of going de to – I definitely go with the flow, which has probably made me realise I maybe I should start <laughs> <laughs> taking it a little bit more serious. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's just the way. I don't know. Less stress for me, the better. So, yeah, I don't get too hooked on that stuff, to be honest. Um yeah, I, I don't know if that's the answer everyone wants to hear. Nah, that's <laughs> all right. I, yeah, I kind of get it. For you. Yeah, yeah. There's only like, you know, if you say you're in Greece, you can, you know, you, you can't smash heaps of euros and things like that. You've got to kind of live with what you got. So that's fair enough. What, what about like pre-race rituals the night before? Like, do you have any, like, do you eat a certain thing? Like, To be honest, I, again, I don't really... <laughs> I don't have many, any, sorry, not many. I just need to have a big breakfast the morning of. And one thing I like, I finally realised this year was for some weird reason I have to put my left sock and shoe on first. And I don't know, it's not like I feel like it's unlucky or anything, I just don't feel right if I don't put it on first before my ride. So I don't know if that's a ritual or if that's just weird. I'm leaning more towards weird. But, um <laughs> Like, I tried doing it the other, t like, I tried starting with my right foot one time and I was like, nah, I think I'm going to vomit. I have to do left foot. So, <laughs> yeah, if you have to pick something, that's probably it. <laughs> well, fair enough. It's more like a superstition, I feel. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. we all have them. But everyone yeah. has all those little weird things before they play. Um, one thing I'm interested in, and I'm sure a few of our listeners are keen to hear this as well, but, you know, the, the lives of, football players, AFL, um, all, all the sort of like the major sports of Australia that, you know, we see flashing on TV every week are, are fairly well documented. You know, we all know what everyone's doing and what their week sort of looks like. But it's not so much for athletics. Like we don't really get that insight that, you know, a lot yeah. of people would love to see. 
So I was just wondering, like, what are what are the three things that you do in sort of like a typical day of, of being a professional athlete? That relate to athletics or just in general? Yeah, well, as a, as someone who does athletics compared to yeah. just, you know, someone who we'd, we'd always see, we, you know, for instance, we know the footballers go and train like at this time during the week and they oh, play on Saturday yeah. and Sunday, whereas like no, don't really have that insight for um, someone who does athletics. Yeah, like a typical day for me would be I'm an early riser, so I usually wake up around 5, 5.30, try and go for a walk just because I can. Um, and I think living in Melbourne, you guys are from Melbourne as well, right? Mm, like, you know, like, yeah. I mean, no be- like the beach isn't like Sydney, but it is quite nice being able to walk along Port Melbourne Beach with everyone. Um, and then I go to training. We usually train from like 9 till 11, and then I'm straight into the physio um, out in Doncaster, come home and then get straight into the gym. So it's a pretty heavy day. And then obviously you have like your social life, study, work, or whatever other commitments weaved in there somehow. But um, yeah, it's quite monotonous. Like it's the same thing every day, very similar to footy. Just take away all of those meetings. I've heard they just have <laughs> a shit ton of meetings, which I'm kind of quite thankful for being in an individual sport. My coach and I just send each other a text, check in, make sure we're doing all right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and in terms of races, I yeah, it just depends on how the body's feeling. That's the other thing I enjoy is that we can kind of pick and choose when we want to race. But then I also do miss, you know, that team environment, playing every week with like your best mates and then just going out on the weekend and hanging out. That's definitely one part I wish we could get away with. But obviously when you watch the Olympics and you see how good all of the other countries are, we just don't get that luxury <laughs> to just slip up all the time. So, yeah. Well, we chatted with uh, Peter Bruckner last week who happens to be Ryan's team doctor at the at the oh. Uni Blues Football Club. And apparently you can pick and choose when you play each week if you are playing a team sport like football. So, really? um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that either until Peter told us about Ryan. Uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm not gonna. I won't delve into it. <laughs> Guess you um, can when you, you know, when you're of the caliber of a thirds football player, you can kind of walk in, walk out when you need to. When you're the captain of the thirds football team, you you can pull rank. Um, <laughs> Didn't ask for that role though. Didn't, <laughs> sign. Didn't actually ask. That's fine. <laughs> um, so it. Morgan, you you've been to the Olympics, which is phenomenal. In the 12 months leading up to. Uh, the Olympic Games, what are the sort of different um, cycles of training that you'll go through during that time? And I'm wondering if, if you could explain perhaps some of the differences in an individual session from cycle to cycle. Yeah, yeah. So oh, at the start of the season, so our, st- our season usually starts, oh, yeah, we'd say August, so at the end of a major competition. Um, we kind of just go straight into off-season and we go into the building phase, which is just building on all the fitness that we had lost tapering. Uh, so that's just all endurance pretty much. And it's definitely not my strong point, which is quite embarrassing. Uh, still building on it. Uh, but yeah, so a typical session for that would be like uh, ooh, six by one K reps off of 90 seconds. Uh, mm. And that's a long way for an X 400 meter runner. Hence <laughs> 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 why I'm not very good at it. Uh, well, you've, you've gone from 400 meters to running 800 meters, correct? Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, and then once the season slowly starts, so the domestic season, then we kind of start to find down and get into that speed endurance type work, which is pretty cool. That's probably my favorite because that's when you're using all of that endurance and then you're adding in the strength side and the speed side to hopefully bring the 800 together. And a typical session would be nine 300s off of three minutes rest at race pace, roughly. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, once we get overseas and we go into the third phase, and that's still very similar to speed endurance, probably more so on the speed side. It's just very 800 focused, and we technically don't focus on any endurance at all, like any of the long work. And yeah, so that's just all like, you know, 200s, 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 like just reps on reps on reps. And it's all just about racing and feeling good, which is kind of fun because it's like, yeah, I'm still training, but it doesn't really matter as much as racing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I love training, but once you get to that tail end, it's kind of nice because then you're just focusing on, you know, hopefully utilizing everything you'd built on at the start of the season, tapering for the 10 days before a race, and then you're just kind of meant to slingshot into a PB or a medal or whatever have you. So, I mean, yeah. I, it sucks because I was injured this season. So we we're very much stuck in the, 
what the fuck are we doing phase. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of swimming, elliptical and bike, which sucks because I missed out on a lot. But um, I think for where we got to was pretty, you know, I'm pretty proud of that. But you always want it to be different when you're injured, right? <laughs> it was my first mm. injury, so I just had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, that's, <laughs> that sucks. It's such poor timing. Um, how, how, how does, your, how does your, uh, your gym work change during those cycles? Oh, yeah, gym. So when we're going through the endurance phase, I'm building on my strength. So I'm not doing any plyo work at all. And that's just trying mm. to hit PB targets in the gym with like uh, clean squats, um, snatches and all that stuff, which is kind of fun because, you know, you still have goals that aren't really track related. And it's nice. Taking, I like taking my mind off of the track. And then as soon as we get into domestic season, that's when it pretty much is using all of that strength and turning in, turning it into a plyo session and seeing how quick we can get off the ground, how fast we're moving in the gym and throwing the weights around. And for me, I don't know, it's tough because I'm trying to keep that 400 element of strength in, whereas a lot of 800 runners I've heard kind of just do body weighted stuff and that just doesn't work for me I because I, I'm a bigger body than most of them. <laughs> I need that strength, <laughs> otherwise it's just like... You're carrying dead weight. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> let's, use it. let's utilize it. So that's yeah. Gym is definitely one of my favorite things. I think because again, it's just not track related at all. Like it helps, but obviously, mm. you know, it's completely different. Mm. This is about as as technical as we'll probably get on the podcast. And I've, I've got a Ooh. degree in exercise science that I've never <laughs> used. So this is this is my chance to actually feel like it was worthwhile. But uh, when <laughs> when you're going through your running gait. And you are focusing on every part of your. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> yeah. no, I study fashion, so I'm like, oh god, running gait. After this, can you? Ex- <laughs> yeah. After this, can you explain what a gait is? After you ask the question, like the way your leg moves, essentially. Right. Okay. But when when you're focusing on the way your leg moves around the track, is there a particular part that you focused on leading up to the Olympics? Because every mm-hmm. kind of part of it is almost like a sequence of mini skills. Yeah. Was there a particular part that you were focusing on to improve the efficiency of your stride? And if so, how do you make sure you, you nail that every time? Mm. Pre-injury, I would have to say the main thing I wanted to focus on was definitely just getting that, getting my hip height back when I'm running, like being tall, which if you sink into the ground, you're just wasting time because you're heavy. And then that essentially means you spend more time on the ground, which means a slower race. So for me, it was like, yeah, building my hip strength up and even the contact time that I was talking about with plyo because the 800, although it's a middle distance event, it's very much a sprint technically. And so, yeah, that just came down to a lot of like bounding, hops, testing in the gym to then transfer that onto the track with like 30 meter sprint testing. And then we lengthen that out to a 100 meter, 120, 150. And then once you know you can carry yourself and think about the contact time over 120 to 200 meters, your mind just and you're practicing that obviously in reps it's like your body just kind of gets used to feeling fast and light Mm. um with the hip stuff it was yeah more so pilates based to be honest just trying to like strengthen the finer muscles but then i got injured (laughs) so i was just focusing on healing my achilles (laughs) (laughs) is is there a particular cue that your coach is saying to you to bring attention to that hip uh, yeah, so I actually worked with my psych on it and I said to her, if I bring too much attention to it, then I break down everywhere else. So we had this simple method called head, shoulders, knees and toes. But when I just think like head, is my head still and am I focused on, you know, wherever my eyesight is, then it's like, are my shoulders relaxed? Is my posture straight? And am, am I tall? And then we go, okay, once you've checked everything off, then it's like, all right, if I'm tall, my hips are up. And then what are my knees doing? Are they driving forward? cool, they're doing that. And then I just think, oh, like pitter patter, pitter patter, pitter patter. I just say that in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a freak. <laughs> um, but yeah, that just kind of helps me move efficiently, just going through the checklist over and over again. Because once you just focus on yourself, then you forget about the external environment. And that's when I've actually ran all my fastest races. Crazy, right? <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> that's awesome. So, yeah. It sounds like keeping things very simple is the way 100%. that you get the best out of yourself. I mean, it's just running at the end of the day, right? <laughs> Why overcomplicate it? <laughs> um, so what are, the, what are the different roles of the people around you who help you be a professional athlete? Far out. 
that. Um, geez. It'd be a vast team. Yeah, it's a pretty good team, to be honest. Um, it's actually a lot smaller than um, previous years because I realised, like, once there are too many people having an opinion, things just go out the window and fall to shit. Fall to pieces, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I've got, like, I guess I'll start at my coach. She's obviously the one that drives the whole thing and will tell me, how, you know, training's on at this time, blah, 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 blah. Then I have my gym coach who does the same thing in the gym. Then I have two different sports psychs who actually work together. It's very hard to explain. One's a sports psych and the other one is like a chiropractor cross. I just I don't really know the word for it. It's almost like Reiki, but it's not Reiki. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but they actually work seamlessly together to help me, my body and my mind kind of get to the start line, which is, they've just been incredible this year, especially with the injuries and travel and being locked out in Sydney. They had my back through everything. So so did my whole team. Um, and then I have my, oh, geez, my, um, I'm just blank. You know how there's like physios, oh, osteo. I was like, what's the name? <laughs> You're killing me if I call him a physio. <laughs> um, he's Steve, Steve Janine. And I've got an osteo in Sydney as well. So it's nice to know whenever I'm traveling, I've always got someone somewhere to help out with my body and just keep it in check. And that's probably the number one thing for me because I hate stretching. So I'm like, I'll pay someone to do the job. Like, just make me feel good. (laughs) (laughs) And then, yeah, I just have my manager who drives the commercial side of Morgan, which is great because obviously, as we all know, athletics doesn't pay a great deal of money. And I think that's, an for me, it's an important part of my track because she knows Morgan needs something new. She needs something fun. She needs to be on her toes, always doing something creative. Otherwise, you've definitely lost me on the track as well as just in life. Um, and then I just have my mum and my family for support. And one of my first coaches, Peter Burke, who's kind of like a sounding board for anything I need because he was there for me when I first started as at, so when I first got a coach at age nine, you know, just playing around, having fun, not nothing serious. But it's kind of cool to see our relationship grow and I've known him for, wow, more than half my life now and he's definitely like the godfather of it all for me, to be honest, (laughs) Um, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, that's – I feel like – am I forgetting anyone? I hope I'm not. (laughs) That's Team Morgan in a nutshell. But I think it's because I'm just firing it off so quick. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. They'll, they'll definitely pull you up if you have. Yeah, so. yeah. I'm forgetting yeah. anyone. Because I sent out a massive thank you text to everyone that was in my corner this year. <laughs> Shit. You seem to have nailed oh, it. Yeah, and I guess I should say actually the big, my biggest sponsor would have to be Jagged um, for obviously the apparel. And they've been just as important because, again, they allow me to have creativity within the brand and then they're so supportive on the track. So for me... I just need everyone to be across what I'm doing, making sure I'm healthy in my mind, my body, running fast, but just to have fun. And, like, everyone that is in my team knows how to have fun, which is something I love, and they're just so, I don't know, it's just so cool knowing that, like, they don't have to, but they do just want to be about me and my career. And, I don't know, it's quite nice because I would find it very epic stressful trying to (laughs) manage me. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. That's awesome. Oh, how good. Um. You mentioned like it's better to keep a tight group rather than have too many people and that can come to sometimes keep it, you know, or make it a bit more stressful than it needs to be. I'm wondering if you've worked with people in the past who have perhaps hindered your performance and if there are some things that students who are looking to work with athletes should avoid doing from from your perspective. Yeah. Um, for me, the number one thing would definitely be managers in the past. I've definitely had a few good ones and then we just didn't, we just kind of, you know, had different interests and parted ways. But then I've definitely had some that were very controlling and manipulative. And I think that's one thing a lot of people in that space, especially when you're dealing with athletes, need to understand. And even, yeah, it's funny actually. It's kind of why I got rid of a lot of my team and subbed them out for other people is because no one actually really wanted to know what I liked and what I wanted to do with my life and where I wanted to head both on the track and off the track. Like even moving from the four to the eight was apparently like the greatest sin I could ever commit because people saw more than the 400 metre runner. They didn't see more than the 400 metre runner that's just like sad all the time trying to, you know, please other people. And I just, I kind of just had enough of it. And that's probably the number one thing I think people need to understand is like, you've got to sit down with the athlete and ask them, what's it, what kind of person do you want to be? 
what goals you have on the track, on the field or whatever, and then what goals you have off of them and how can we help you. Not, oh, you look like this and you're going to be this person and we're only going to do this. And if you steer off of that, then you're worthless and you're worth nothing and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, because I've seen so many, including myself, so many athletes just break down and they compete like crap or they don't even want to train or they want to quit the sport because the pressure is just too much to be someone they're actually not. And I think it's also, that's probably the biggest one for me. I see it happening still even to this day. It's like, far out. Does anyone actually give these athletes a chance to breathe or to think and to be their own person and just to give them freedom to be themselves? Like, it's so important. Like, there's always talk about mental health and whatever have you, but it's usually like, yeah, yeah, speak about mental health, but just don't do it on the field. Like, you know, put on a face and we can deal with it later. It's like, no. <laughs> Yeah. Like, Jesus Christ, if you're not happy, you're not going to do anything. So let's mm-hmm. get to the root of the problem and figure out the athlete and the person first. So yeah. I definitely, yeah, take that into consideration. <laughs> yeah. Why, um, and answers however you want, but wh- why do you think there was so much pressure on that change for 400 to 800? Like it, from an outsider, it just seems like, a, you know, you're doing double the 400. Like I'm sure anyone could you know, with enough training could get to that 800. But for some reason, it seems like that was such a, a big issue. Yeah, it's quite funny. I think I think it's because I had such great success that came along quite quickly with the four. Like, you know, like I, yeah. I think I had like six months of training before the Com Games trials and then I came out and won and I'm a junior going into the seniors and people just, you know, you think of Freeman, who's one of the – yeah, she's like an icon in Australia and if not, you know, track and field as well for sure. And they just think, oh, another 400 girl, let's just say, you know, let's just market her as the next Kathy Freeman. And that's where yeah. the pressure came. I was just like, mm. read the stats. She's like top five. I think she's got the fifth fastest time in the world ever, you know. Mm. And for me it was like I'm training so hard. Yes, I've made all the teams as a 400 runner. It's great. But I'm training so hard and my PB, I'm not getting faster. I'm not enjoying it. I'm feeling like everyone just wants me to be somebody I'm not, you know, in terms of like what kind of athlete I should be, what I should be doing, what races I should be running. And so that's why I kind of like took a step back after the 2018 Com Games, went on a, a massive Europe trip. Yeah. <laughs> and I, Which we I love. Really, yeah, <laughs> I don't regret. Funny, but, um, I, I was in Europe in 2018 too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I went to Monaco Diamond League and I remember watching and I was just in awe. I thought, far out, like I don't want to quit the sport 100%. And this just kind of, you know, ignited that fire again. But I just knew if I kept going, I wouldn't run the four. And so, yeah, I just said, okay, well, I'm going to try running eights. <laughs> it's so <laughs> random because I used to do them when I was little. And, um, yeah, I, I felt like I had a point to prove and all I wanted to prove that prove was that if you were happy, you could do anything. And so when I found Liz, my coach, I was like, look, I want to start the A. I just want to be happy and fit. And then we started training and I was like, and I want to make world champs in 2019. And that's when everyone was like, take a back seat. That's not going to happen. And for me, I was like, yeah, no, it's going to happen. I've already written it in my diary. We're doing it. So to actually do it was just like self-belief is a crazy thing. You know what I mean? It was just so nice to finally finally do something that I wanted to do and actually tick that box and prove everyone wrong. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome. I think that's such a valuable insight for for students or for anybody who comes across an athlete that even though everyone might want, you know, the best possible result, the way to get there isn't always go harder, go faster, yeah. do what we've always done, actually having a level of empathy for the person who's got to do the job and doing what's going to keep them happy so that they can actually do the things to train up to that point is probably going to be the best point. So as you say, like... <laughs> giving you the freedom to be who you want to be and actually yeah. be happy to mm. do the job seems to be um, a crucial part of it. Yeah. Who Funny would have that. thought that would have been? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, Morgan, the, the team of researchers at SportsGuard HQ have, have found, have obviously oh, delved right. into who you are and your background during the week. Uh, lots of preparation goes into these podcasts, but we've found that you're obviously involved with a few huge brands like F45. You mentioned Team Jagger just then. Tizit Watches, huge brand. Um, what's your involvement in those commercial deals that you do? Is it, is it more so something you just give to your manager to handle or are you more involved and do you understand the details and, and 
be part of those conversations before you've sort of signed on the dotted line? Yeah. Um, to be honest, it's quite funny. Like usually my manager handles it because kind of, not in an arrogant way, but we did have a lot coming in and she just said, look, let me deal with it all. Let me work out the numbers, what they want, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll come to you. And the thing I love about my manager and I is that we're just so brutally honest with one another. I just say like, lay it down for me. What do they want? And you know, I just say, tell them I said this. Like, I need them to know that this is coming from my mouth, not yours. Um, because it's it's like at the end of the day, I'm selling my image, you know what I mean? And to me that's a great deal because, like, who knows where your image is going to be? Who knows where they want to put it? I need to find all that out to understand my work and I need them to understand that too. And for me it's like, you know, the big brands like F45, Tissot, Jagged, Clinique, I kind of thought, okay, running only lasts – about this long, 10 years or whatever, my life is going to go for who knows how long. What can I get out of these brands to help me for my future? I want to, one, establish a good relationship because they believe in me and I believe in them. Two, I want to, you know, for example, Jagged, I don't want you guys to just give me money and say, hey, wear this. I want to come up with some products. So I've got a collection coming out because I know that's, they know that's something I'm passionate about and that's going to hopefully help my career after athletics is once people can see my creative side, I'm hoping a different career can come out of it. And then it's like, F45, cool. I would love to, you know, buy a gym, come up with my own exercise, have it in the F45 studio. So I'm kind of just trying to think outside the box of signing that dotted line and being like, hey, money, cool, buy this product because I'm just getting paid. It's like, no, you've given to me, I want to give back, and then I also want to create something with you guys moving forward. So once my career is done, I'm... 40 years old, looking like a prune because I've been tanning every day. (laughs) 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 I've still got something to fall back on and I think it's good to make these connections with big brands because who knows where it can take you, right? Like my next Mm. goal is to go to America and try new things or to bring out my own apparel brand once I have retired. Or I think the number one thing for me though is actually I want to be in a Disney movie. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, so but, um, this is just a shameless plug if anyone's watching this and has connections <laughs> <laughs> but I just think that's important to have a lot you know whatever opportunities are thrown at you see how you can actually yeah. kind of I don't know grow that relationship and have some sort of longevity it's important mm. I think yeah mm. that's awesome and I think uh, yeah it, it's cool to hear an athlete say like I want to enter a brand ambassador deal from a partnership perspective rather than just a commercial plug perspective. Yeah, yeah. Mm. it's become tiring, I'm sure. <laughs> I've done a lot yeah. of them and you just realise they just don't align with your values and it's quite embarrassing when your friends yeah. are making you on the group chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask, like, because there's good and bad parts of every single job, no matter what you do. Yeah. And, like, what, what are some of the good parts of working with different brands and then what are some of the, the parts you prefer to do less of uh, I think the good parts are I enjoy the photo shoots and stuff for sure and flying to Sydney and you know back and forth from there Melbourne around the world blah 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 I think that's really cool and you get to meet other brand ambassadors and connect with them I think the hard part and parts I wish for me it was all about balance that was the hardest part I'm trying to manage an injury go to these photo shoots and train for the Olympics and we got it a little bit wrong this year where we kind of focused a little bit too much on that which I don't regret at all because I learned a lot. But another part, it goes back to like what I was saying about people understanding me as a person. And a lot of smaller deals I signed this year, the marketing manager didn't understand me as a person. So they'd be like, here's a product, send us your caption. I send a caption. They'd be like, no, it's not good enough. Send another one. No, it's not good enough. I'm like, okay, tell me how to speak to my audience. <laughs> and then they send you one and it's like, I was just like, okay. And I think that's one thing they need to get is like, understand you want it to come across as authentic right Mm. so that's probably the number one thing for me is I wish I just had a little bit more control with the smaller brands but the brands I'm working with now are just so team Morgan they're like just be your own person this is exactly what we want and that's what I love I think that's just again so important because you get caught out (laughs) and there are so many times I've been caught out (laughs) so yeah Yeah. balance and authenticity (laughs) good little formula yeah. Um, now I, I must say, yeah, you, sometimes you look at those things on like Instagram and you're like, that's so, it looks forced. So I can totally understand like as 
I can't totally understand because I've got no idea how you live your life. But I can imagine if you were yourself and you're being forced to write this random caption that doesn't really represent you, it would be quite uncomfortable. So, um, no, I can certainly see that out there. So it's noticeable. So it's good yeah. to notice yourself. Um, <laughs> we've spoken a little bit about your manager tonight. Like I feel like she's come into conversation quite a bit. But what was so important about you know, how you choose your manager and what was the most important things before you make that decision? Yeah, um, it was quite funny. I was actually managing myself in 2019 and then came across IMG after doing a photo shoot for the Witchery White Shirt Foundation and I had a meeting with them and it was kind of like I didn't really get to choose which manager I wanted because there were so many, but I was also like, well, IMG, give me whoever because you guys are like the gold standard, right? And Jess and I can you, had a can you good explain a bit about who IMG are for people who who might not have heard of them? Oh yeah, so IMG is like a global um, managing company, and they manage not only talent but mainly like models and actors. And um, now they're right. very much they're quite heavily getting into the sporting space as well, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think they just they have a lot of connections, a lot of contacts around the world. And it, I don't know, just their setup is perfect. Like, uh, to me, they're just like an elite man- like a, an elite company. And when they were like, yeah, we want to manage you, I nearly fainted. I was like, what the fuck? Because <laughs> I used to like, <laughs> like, I was like, I'm not a model really at all. I mean, where are you going to fit me? They're like, oh, no, no, the talent section. And then they explained, like, we could do a lot on social media and brand ambassador deals and blah, blah, blah. And so I was sold. And it was kind of cool because Jess and I hit it off straight away and she's just such I mean I'm now with Lisa because Jess had a child so she's on maternity leave and Lisa's just as cool but yeah both of them are just like I don't know I think it was nice that they knew their worth and they were confident in their own ability which I needed to see as well because I didn't want to have to be the one relying like always thinking shit are they doing the right thing by me are they doing the right job at all and I don't know they're just two very strong cool women where they know how to have fun but when push comes to shove I wouldn't try pushing them, right? Like, <laughs> it's quite scary. <laughs> Even I'm like, yep, <laughs> love it. That's what I need because then I just know I don't have to worry because they're going to get the job done. As soon as you have to worry and then you're managing yourself, it's like, well, why am I giving you guys a cut anyway? <laughs> Jeez, yeah. might as well pay my mum. <laughs> so, yeah, no, they, they do a very good job um, managing, managing me in my life. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, last one from us, Morgan, um, and this may be looking a bit too far in the future because we know you've still got plenty of running to do, but, um, when you think about your career or whatever you do, understanding why you do it is fairly critical if you want to have success doing it. And, um, a lot of people enter the sports industry without really knowing why they want to do what they do. Yeah. Uh, but then you see a lot of athletes who enter the sports industry as well, and they seem to have a much tighter grip on why they do what they do because it's come from some form of lived experience. Either they want to, you know, give back to the sport or help other athletes experience what they've experienced. I'm wondering if, um, you know, if your experience through sport or the other stuff that you've done as well has started to shape what your future career aspirations are. Yeah, I think it has. It was quite funny. When I first started, I was just like, oh, I want to do this because you get to travel the world for free. (laughs) which is kind of not good (laughs) but I was a kid right I was like 17 18 I'd never been overseas before so that part was the most attractive part to me at that point in time and then for me I think that is the thing like the way I grew up which is I guess this is me being extremely vulnerable here but you know it was like a single parent family mum's a gem and I just seeing her struggle and like understanding that my coach had to pay for me to get around Australia and all that was quite, it's not, I wouldn't say embarrassing because my mom's like the strongest person I've ever met, but you do really feel for her knowing like she's doing everything she can. And then all the opportunities I got from that, I was just like, whoa, I do not want, I do want to give back to the community and do stuff like that because I've realized kids deserve like the world, right? And I don't want anyone to go through what I had to go through to get to where I am now. And you do learn that along the way. Like I've roomed with people on Diamond Leagues that were adopted or, you know, have been, have fled their country to escape war. And it's just like, shit, sport really can bring people together. And I just wish it's something we could all experience. And that's when it comes back to sponsors. I'm like, well, okay, cool, jagged. 
I know how hard it was buying crop tops and briefs and spikes. So I want to get into that sports marketing role once I'm on the tail end of my career and give back to young athletes with, you know, making, sponsoring a few of them, but then also making our products come from a cheaper price point so they can actually afford it and not have to worry about their next, you know, pair of shorts or paycheck or whatever have you. And kind of just get people to enjoy sport and see that it can bring a lot of opportunities, if that makes sense, because it really does. Like I look at, oh my gosh, I look at where I started working at Cold Rock as a 15-year-old, like $12 <laughs> an hour, two shifts a week for three hours to where I am now. It's like it can be done and it is possible. And I would just hope one day I can like kind of teach the younger generation that like it doesn't matter where you come from or how you grew up. It's, you know, all you have to really do is actually work hard. You're not going to fall behind if you're working hard. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's funny that you touched on that because it is something I am quite passionate about but have never really spoken on because I'm just waiting for the right time to really build on it and bring it to light, if that makes sense. Mm. I was going to ask, like, are there any steps yeah. you've taken towards realising some of those ideas or is it just in the back of your mind? Uh, steps, not so much yet because this year was hectic in itself. I was actually trying to look for more time to have to myself because I had moments where I felt like I was giving myself to everyone and I thought I can't do anything 100% if I'm praying. Like I'm, or Even right now I'm so physically and mentally and emotionally exhausted just because of the year that's been, which is totally fine. But I definitely know between now and Paris I am slowly going to work on projects trying to kind of expand that and get more people involved, you know, to hopefully one day start um, to start, like, say, a foundation for disadvantaged children or to align with ones that I've already talked to. Because, like, we used, we grew up in um, Werribee and then mum used to take us to uh, Cottage by the Sea. It's a place you go to when things aren't going well at home and, and stuff like that where I'm like, oh, talk to me more. How can I give back? Because you guys, you know, were a huge part of my life growing up. So, yeah, steps are being taken, but it's also just like, if I'm going to do something, I need to make sure I give 100%, otherwise it's just going to fall to shit. And I don't want <laughs> I have no time for that. <laughs> no, so, well, fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Um, well, Morgan, we'll, we'll let you get back to, uh, to quarantining in Darwin. Um, <laughs> it is, it's been absolutely awesome talking to you and just hearing just your honest answers to our questions. It's been amazing sort of just getting insight into – you know, your day-to-day -day and life as a professional athlete in athletics, it's been really cool talking to you. So I can see that TV behind you that will probably be the uh, the source of your entertainment for the next the think, yeah, the, the next few days. Um, but, no, we appreciate you giving, giving an hour of your time tonight to, to chat to yeah. us. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Alrighty, Rubes. Well, we've allowed Morgan to get back to her quarantine activities up in Darwin. Um, that was really um, struggling for words and how to really describe that. It's just honest, honest and raw. I think is the is the other words to mm. describe that. What's what's some things you learnt, Rubes? Uh, I think uh, the number one thing I, you know, I think I personally want to do this as well. But people listening should really take the time to do this little activity. Is actually write down why you want to do what you do if that's not clear to you as you just heard morgan beautifully spell out if you've got a reason to do something that is important to you personally it becomes really really compelling so she's got her reasons for wanting to start all these different initiatives uh, a lot of people listening to this will have their reasons for wanting to work in sport and a lot of them are, are kind of you know, at a, at a high level, high level why? Like I want to bring people together. Okay, well, why do you want to bring people together? Oh, because it, you know, it makes, it fosters strong relationships. Okay, well, why do you want to foster strong relationships? Just keep asking yourself why, why, why until you really get down to the nitty gritty. Then you'll have an answer that is uh, specific to you and compelling when you share it with other people. So I think take the time to go through that little activity. Yeah, no, I think it's a good one. I am... Um... I loved when she was sort of chatting about the things not to do um, when you're working with athletes and also just the team that she has around her. Um, the key part is is empathy and, and show empathy towards athletes first of all before you get onto the performance side because she mentioned, you know, a few managers she's had didn't really think about what she actually wants to do and 
you know, are kind of just telling her what she should do and often wasn't making her happy at all and wasn't fulfilled. So um, that just kind of hammered home that fact that, you know, they're a person first and foremost. They're not just a runner um, and they, they sort of need to be happy first to be able to perform. The last one for me, for those working with the athletes from a high-performance high perspective and trying to train them, keep it simple, keep it fun. Like you heard Morgan explain that, you know, heads, shoulders, knees and toes is the trigger that she needs to, to run quick. Simple as that. And then it's just pitter-patter, pitter-patter, pitter-patter. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, get your knee up at this angle and then move your foot down at this speed and make sure this is, you know, activated and all that sort of stuff. Keep it simple, like Morgan said, because sometimes that can elicit the best results with the athletes you're working with. Yeah. Last one from me is probably just avoid curry uh, in 35 <laughs> degree heat. Apparently, that's getting a good run <laughs> up at uh, at the quarantine facilities up there for our athletes. So, um, good luck to those that are listening. There'll be a few listening. Um, obviously, some great fans of the show up there. So, um, thanks for listening. Find us on LinkedIn. Flick us a message. We'll see you next time.